Last week, we began a series called The Assurance of Salvation. The Assurance of Salvation. Every believer needs to have assurance that they are saved. Not enough to have the salvation. It's important to have that assurance. And don't get me wrong. Even if you don't have assurance, if you are saved, you are still safe only. Problem is you don't know you're safe. The people who don't have the assurance don't know they are safe. If they are saved, they, will, they are safe and they will end up in heaven, you know, and they'll be safe for all eternity. But the journey will be a miserable journey for them if they don't know that they are safe. Until they get to heaven, they'll have no peace. You know, people who have doubts about their salvation, <clears throat> they lose their peace, you know. If they don't have peace about this, they can't have peace about anything. They lose their joy. They lose their boldness. When a person has doubts about their own salvation, there's no boldness there. No boldness to do anything. God has called each one of us to do something great for his kingdom, for his glory. But when we have this kind of problem, you know, doubts about our salvation, it just drains out all the boldness. It fills us with doubt, and worry, you know, and fear. And we hold back. There is no boldness to go forward and do the things God has called us, called us to do. So this is a very serious matter, this doubts about salvation. When a person has doubts about salvation, it affects their whole life. It affects every area of life. I spoke more about it last week. It has to be taken very seriously. The truth is, many believers have doubts about salvation. The thing is, they don't know what to do or where to go. When the doubts come, they don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. They don't know how, they don't know how to deal with those doubts. See, today we are going to teach you how to deal with those doubts. Where do you go? When doubt arises, where do you go? How do you deal with those doubts? <clears throat> the goal of this is, By the end of today's message, you'll know what to do, where to go. And you can go there and find assurance. <clears throat> and you can get rid of that doubt. You can find true assurance. And when that comes, you see, you get back your peace, you get back your joy, and you're able to move forward in your <clears throat> spiritual life. <clears throat> so that's what we're going to look at today. Today, we're going to look at what to do, where to go when the doubts come. How do you deal with the doubts? What do you do? Where do you go? Well, the answer is, you go to the sources of assurance. You go to the sources of assurance. There are certain sources that God has given us, which will, if you go to them, if you pay attention to them, if you focus on them, surely you will get assurance. They will surely end up giving you true assurance. Just as doubt has its own sources, assurance, Assurance has its own sources. You know, doubt has many sources. If, if, there's, if you're going through doubts about salvation, if you're having doubts about salvation, there are many reasons why a person has doubts about salvation. Main reason is sin. When they sin, maybe repeated sin, maybe something unusual, doubt about salvation could come. Another reason, it's not always just sin. It's other reasons as well, such as their background, the people's background, you know. Different people have different backgrounds. And some people, their family background, they may, may not have received the uh, love of a human father, for example. You know, the human father, in certain situations, human fathers have forsaken their children, dealt badly with their children. And so the person who has gone through that kind of difficult childhood, when the heavenly father says, I will never leave you, they are doubting <laughs> Because the human father left them, see. When the heavenly father says this and that, they are not able to believe. Because of their background. Some people's church background itself keeps them in doubt. Because their church background, in that background, they kept saying, will you go, will you not go? If Jesus comes right now, will you be taken or will you be left behind, right? Constantly, that kind of <clears throat> talk ends up leaving them in doubts. 
and so because of that itself they may not have committed great sin but because of that kind of talk i hearing that again and again they are stuck in a state of doubt you know they somehow learn to manage it and put it aside and cover it up and just you know move on doubts have many reasons sometimes circumstances when somebody doesn't have a doubt and then sometimes very terrible circumstances come and everything appears to be going wrong in life you know and then the doubt comes in the mind you know if all this is happening how can we still believe that god is for us if he is for us then why is all this happening if he is with me then why is all this happening maybe he is not for me maybe he is not with me maybe this whole thing is a lie <laughs> see that's a, that's a bigger problem bigger doubt see circumstances bring doubt there are many reasons for why doubt arises but there are also many sources from where assurance arises and today i want to talk to you about let the doubt come from anywhere but i'm going to tell you certain sources if you go to them you will find assurance true assurance and you will grow in that and the doubt will go my friend <laughs> what are these sources number 1 source number 1 of assurance today we're going to give you certain sources few of the sources important sources and then we're also going to teach you how to use them practically how not to use them <laughs> how to use them how not to use them right this is the goal today we're going to show you tell you what these sources are show you how to use them number one the source number one <clears throat> is the gospel of jesus christ the gospel of jesus christ everybody say the gospel <clears throat> the gospel what is the gospel well <clears throat> the gospel that's a simple term right it means the basic truth about what jesus did through his death and resurrection for us yeah the gospel we're all familiar with the gospel we know that word right the gospel has to do with certain facts about jesus what kind of facts 2000 years ago historically he actually came born of a virgin and he actually lived on this earth this earth this is not uh, some kind of uh, fable this happened historically it's a fact it's a historical fact Jesus actually entered this world lived as a man for 33 and a half years <clears throat> and then how did he die that's very important those facts he suffered and he died on a cross and he shed his blood those are all facts and then on the third day he rose again we believe that is a fact historical fact right that's why we are believers right so these are all facts about jesus but facts alone don't make up the gospel it's the meaning of the facts if he simply came and lived and died and rose again and went away and that's it there's no gospel in that what's the good news about that he did all of that for me <laughs> he did all of that for everybody say for me why did he come my friend he came for you he came for me he lived a perfect life for himself to prove his own perfection for me for me that's the gospel the gospel says he did it all everything that happened to him happened to him for you and me why did he suffer so much because he deserved it no he suffered because i deserved it and yet he took my suffering why did he shed his blood on a cross why die on a cross because he bore my sin and the curse of that sin and curse it is the one who hangs upon a tree the bible says that's why he hung on a cross for me bearing my sin bearing my curse and every last drop of blood he shed for everybody say for me you got to personalize it <clears throat> otherwise it doesn't move you see that's the gospel the facts about jesus and the meaning of the facts and how it benefits you right we have all heard some version of the gospel <clears throat> that is how we got saved think back to the time when you got saved think back to the time when you first put your trust in Jesus you heard something about the gospel maybe a simple version somebody told you maybe a preacher maybe your sunday school teacher maybe your friend i don't know who first gave you the gospel you heard it and you believed it and you got saved now think back to that time when you got saved you also got a little bit of assurance just remember it think back did you get some assurance you didn't even think of it as assurance but you were you were at peace you know you had some kind of assurance or some kind of peace yeah my sins are forgiven i am okay i am safe 
when a person usually gets saved immediately they don't get doubts about salvation what they get immediately is confidence assurance <clears throat> right now let me ask you where did that assurance come from the first time you got assurance you don't even realize it right but now think back to your own experience most of the experiences are like this right when the, when we get saved immediately we get assurance i'm asking where did that assurance come from <clears throat> you didn't know much about the bible you didn't know much then where did the assurance come from it came from the gospel which you heard that simple gospel which you heard and believed and got saved through right the same gospel which saved you you didn't even realize also gave you assurance in the beginning that's where you got your assurance for the first time you got assurance from what the gospel everybody say the gospel so <clears throat> why is this important when you lose your assurance <laughs> right when you get your doubts now where do you go you go back first to the gospel you back go back to the gospel you go back to the same source which first not only gave you salvation but also gave you assurance and you go back you bring it back to mind you think about the gospel you meditate on the gospel and my friend you will again get assurance the gospel has the power you know the gospel is very powerful the bible says paul says i am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of god unto salvation the gospel has power to save now let me ask you does it not have the power to give you assurance that you are saved surely assurance is not greater than salvation salvation only is greater the gospel has the power to give you salvation it surely has the power to give you the assurance that you are saved so what do you do you go back to that gospel everybody say go back believers think the gospel is not for them you know no but you go back it's the same thing i said last week i said it differently i said look at the cross remember i said if you have doubts what is the solution look at the cross it's the same thing the cross is the center of the gospel message so when i say look at the cross it's the same thing it's like saying look at the center of the gospel <clears throat> today i'm putting it in a little broader term and i say look at the gospel focus on the gospel look at the cross <clears throat> when you have doubts don't look at yourself look at the <clears throat> cross and the more you look at the cross the more your doubt goes away and the more you get assurance see jesus suffering and hanging on the cross <clears throat> meditate on that <clears throat> see him doing it all for you <laughs> see everybody say for me that's the key you see <clears throat> whatever is causing you doubt especially if it is sin right the cross will easily quickly solve it right if some sin in your life has now led you to doubt your salvation and is disturbing you so much what do you do look at the cross look at the gospel center of the gospel is the cross and you say jesus died for my sins right even this sin even the sin and you see again your sin being put on the lord jesus christ on the cross he is bearing even this sin all my sin he bore that is the gospel right but some people say brother you don't know about my sin you know my sin is very great do you believe in the greatness of your sin or do you believe in the greatness of the power of the blood of jesus see what is greater the blood of jesus is able to cleanse us from all sin all sin no matter what it is you see remind yourself of the gospel my friend <clears throat> when you go back to the gospel you get assurance when you go back to the cross you get assurance second secondly second source second source where do you go when you have doubts about salvation and by the way these uh, sources are, don't are not just for when you have doubts about salvation let me also say that these are sources especially source 1 and source 2 you can go to if you have any doubt in fact i will say this you can go to if you have any problem even <clears throat> the gospel is the answer to all problems that's what we believe Jesus is the answer to we say Jesus is the answer right what do we mean what he did on the cross in his death and resurrection is the answer to all of man's problem whether the problem is sickness or financial or i don't care what the solution is the cross <laughs> right so it applies to anything that you're going through 
not just if you have doubts about <coughs> salvation but it applies to doubts about salvation as well <coughs> so the number one source is the gospel the number you know i will uh, elaborate more on the gospel maybe next week but today i just want to introduce you quickly to certain sources second source source number 2 where do you go when doubts come about your salvation source number 2 is the promises of god the promises of god the promises of god everybody say promises the bible has thousands of promises people count and say 5000 something or 6000 something right thousands of promises and among those promises are many many promises about our salvation they relate to our <coughs> salvation various aspects of our salvation when you have doubts what you do is you go to those promises and you look at them and you focus on them the more you focus on them the more your doubts will go away and the more you will get <coughs> assurance promises right let me give you an example acts chapter 10 verse 43 <clears throat> the first one is gospel second one is promises acts 10:43 to acts 10:43 to him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes to him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name Now this is Peter is preaching here to Gentiles to a Gentile crowd. Okay, this is the first time gospel is going to Gentiles. Okay, Peter is preaching and look. I want you to look at the kind of assurance he gives. We don't notice this, but in the preaching of the gospel itself, there is assurance. Right? Look at that. He says, "Everyone who believes." You see that word? To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives. forgiveness of sins what is peter saying everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of <clears throat> does that include you yes it says everyone who believes in him <clears throat> do you believe in him then it includes you every everybody say everyone nobody is left out everyone who believes not everyone in the world but everyone who believes in him receives what forgiveness of <clears throat> since you don't see any doubt there you don't see any qualification do you you don't say everyone who believes in in him receives forgiveness for most of the sins receives a blanket forgiveness of sins you see assurance there don't you everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins so what do you do you take a verse like this and you look at those words and you meditate on the those words everyone means me everyone means i believe in him i receive forgiveness of sins see you go to this verse it turns you to the gospel they both are related you know <clears throat> and i receive forgiveness of sins right who saying this not just peter peter is preaching but look the way peter is saying he says i am not only saying it all the prophets bear witness to this all the prophets bear He saying not only me man all the prophets of the old testament say this only that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of so peter is saying the whole bible is saying everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins now let me ask you there are doubts in our head right people going through doubts what happens the doubts you know they get crazy <clears throat> all kinds of voices in the head right all kinds of arguments going on when the doubts come you know the mind works very amazingly <laughs> over it's working uh, feverishly you know over time very busy other times mind won't work well when the doubts about salvation come it works very all oh, the arguments are going back and forth in the head you know all kinds of things what do you do my friend don't just sit there and take that and hear all those voices in your head open your bible and go to a verse like this and say the whole bible says everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins i receive forgiveness of sins i stand on this promise i don't believe in these doubts you see what i mean what are you going to believe the hundred voices in your head or the one word of god one promise of god what is more believable what is more trustworthy the voices in your head or the voice of god in his word the promise of god my friend 
What do you think of the promise of God? How do you value it? How do you esteem it? The voices in your head are not so important. Look at the promises of God. Next verse, while Peter is preaching this, this kind of thing, Peter is preaching, this time only, the Holy Spirit falls on the Gentiles. The next verse says, while he was preaching these things, the Holy Spirit, the power of this kind of preaching, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin. Peter is just preaching this and right in the middle, the Holy Spirit falls on the Gentiles. My friend, this is a powerful word. You have to take words like this, promises like this and put your faith in it. When the doubts come, you go to the promises. Another example of a promise, John chapter 6 verse 47. John chapter 6 verse 47. This is Jesus speaking here. John 6 47. When the doubts come, you go to the promises. Here's an example. Most assuredly or truly, truly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Jesus is speaking. What does he say? Truly, truly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. Life. Do you see any doubt there? <laughs> it's fully sure, assurance, right? What does he do? He says, if you believe in me, you have eternal life. He who believes in me, no matter who is he, no matter who he is, he who believes in me has eternal life. But the voices in your head say you don't have eternal life. The voices in your head say you don't deserve to get eternal life. The voices in your head say you lost that eternal life. No matter what it says, you, you don't just keep listening to that. Go to the word, take the promise and look at one simple line like this, my friend. And say, Jesus said, he who believes in me. I believe in Jesus. Therefore, I have eternal life. Do you believe in Jesus, my friend? I'm not saying are you perfect. You may have a hundred problems. 100 weaknesses, failures. Question is, do you believe in Jesus? If the answer is yes, then you have eternal life. That's his word. I'm ready to accept his word more than any other thousand voices in somebody's head. If you believe in, if you say, yes, I believe in Jesus, then on the basis of God's word, you have eternal life. Well, if you say, well, I'm not sure, brother, you know, I'm trying to believe as much as possible. As much as possible, I'm believing, but I don't know if I'm believing enough. That's okay, don't worry. What do you do? You say to Jesus, Jesus, I believe in you as much as possible, but I want to believe more. You help me to believe more. You keep looking at him and he will help you believe more, my friend, and you will get your eternal life even if you don't already have it. See, last week I said, you cannot go wrong by focusing on Jesus. You cannot, can you go wrong? No. You cannot go wrong. Even if you say, I don't think I believe in Jesus, brother, you know. I say, look at Jesus. You keep looking at him, the belief will come. He's like that. You keep looking at him, he will cause faith to rise from within you. Right? No matter who you are, what kind of situation, what kind of doubt, I say, forget about those voices in your head. Take this one word which Jesus says, hey, he who believes in me has eternal life. And as if that is not enough, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to. He doesn't have to put that. He doesn't have to say, truly, I say to you. Everything he says is true. But he adds two truly's. Why? It's almost like he's begging. He's saying, you know, please believe what I'm saying. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me has eternal life. Is that enough? That one word is more powerful than the thousand doubts in a person's head. If they are willing to accept this word, my friend. Go to the promises of God. When the doubts come, go to the gospel. Secondly, go to the promises. Everybody say gospel. Promises. You got to memorize this. <laughs> Certain things you have to memorize. Right? They're writing it down. All of them. You know our uh, intermediates. Certain things you got to memorize. You know, you got to... The biggest problems in life are not because of the problem itself, are because we don't know what to do when the problems come. <laughs> you know, when we don't know what to do, when they have, see, everybody goes through problems, all kinds of problems. But some people know how to deal with the problems when the problems arise. 
that's sometimes the victory between the difference between those who win and those who lose you know they all go through problems but the ones who win somehow know what to do when the problems come and how to manage them and how to go past them right you got to know before it comes you got to you got to prepare how to handle certain problems you know even in uh, they tell us as children right memorize certain phone numbers you want to call the police memorize this number it used to be 100 right you want to call the fire department you memorize another number you want to call the ambulance memorize another number but i think the government saw and they saw nobody is memorizing nobody is they don't know when the problem comes then only they be going and searching for the number so now they have made it one number do you know what the number is in india there is a one emergency number now you don't have to know a separate number for police separate number for fire and all that it's one number do you know what it is it's 112 single emergency number you can't say you didn't learn anything today then right 1 1 2 any emergency that's a single number you call that they will send you know they'll assist in any way police fire ambulance whatever <coughs> they're trying to get us to memorize it right and know it beforehand so that we can help ourselves and help others now i'm talking about something more important my friend for a believer the worst problem is doubt about salvation because <laughs> he saved the problem is doubt about the salvation you memorize what should you do when the doubts come go to the gospel everybody say gospel <laughs> second thing is you go to the promises of god those two you memorize those two are the most important one but now let me introduce a third one source number 3 source number 3 our changed life our changed or transformed life the bible relates our assurance and our life our assurance and our life it it teaches something like this if you are living a changed and transformed life that itself will give you some kind of assurance that you are saved when you see the changes and transformation in your own life it gives you a sense of assurance confidence yes i am saved have you been surprised by your own self not in a bad way in a good way sometimes we're surprised by ourselves in a bad way you know i never thought i was so bad you know I never thought I had that bad thought in my mind or something. Now I'm talking about surprised by yourself in a good way. Have you surprised yourself in a good way? Suddenly you realize, you know, how did I become so good at this, you know? Or or how did I become better in this, you know? How did I leave all those sins? For example, right? I used to be doing those sins, but now I don't find myself doing it and I don't even find myself going after it or even desiring it, right? How, how did i end up desiring these kinds of things when everybody in the world wants to go do something else how come i want to go and do the things that god wants in his word have you seen changes in your life and are you surprised by that do you see that kind of transformation do you see yourself leaving sin more and more and doing righteousness more and more do you see yourself obeying god's commandments more and more do you see love for god growing more and more do you see changes and transformation do you see yourself more concerned about others than yourself do you see yourself doing good works loving others forgiving others these kinds of changes transformations before salvation a person is different after salvation a person is different because god does something really on the inside he does a heart surgery he gives us a new heart and a new spirit it makes us a new creation on the inside fills us with new desires new pursuits new purposes right do you see those kinds of things in your life when you see that that itself gives you a sense of assurance that you are saved a transformed life is a source you see let me show you that the bible actually teaches this 1 john 2 3 1 john 2 3 uh, last week i was, i told i said that uh, 1 john the first epistle of john is uh, the main subject of that book is assurance of salvation john actually through, through the entire book he gives various tests for salvation and he says if you 
if you pass this test, then you are saved. If you pass that test, then you are saved. And he wants to give assurance. That's the actual goal of it. We'll maybe spend more time later. But just look at one of those tests here. 1 John 2 and verse 3. John says, And by this we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments. What does he mean? He's saying, we have come to know him. What does that mean? We have come to know him. It means not we know him, his name, what he, no, no. We have come to know him. It means we've become believers. We've become his family. He is our father. We are his children. If you look in verse uh, 5, look at this. Uh, <clears throat> By this we may know that we are in him. By this we may know that we are. So in him, come to know him, it's all the same. What he means to say is, we have received salvation, we are in him, we have come to know him, but how do we know that we have come to know him? How do we know that we are in him? By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. He's saying if we keep his, now he doesn't mean perfectly because before this two verses, before this only if you read, he says if any man has sin, don't worry, confess the sin. A few verses before this only he says that. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive. And then if you look at two verses before this, chapter 2 verse 1, he says, I write these things to you that you don't sin, so that you won't sin. But if, there, if you do sin, don't worry. We have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sin. So he's not talking about you don't have any sin, you're living a perfect life, but he is talking about a life where your holiness grows, your obedience to God grows. There is real change and real transformation. He says, if we keep his commandments, if we... Keep his commandments. When you look at your whole life, the whole tone of your life, is it one of obedience or disobedience? You know, if you keep his commandments, by this we know we have come to know him. Look at verse um, four. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Verse five, but whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. He's saying, you can't say I know God. You can't say I'm saved. I'm a believer. But then no evidence of transformation in life. There's something wrong about that. A believer who has absolutely no evidence, there's something wrong. There's no match there. Is something seriously wrong. So John says, keeping the commandments itself or doing what God says, pleasing God, assures us that we are saved. Okay? So the three sources we have looked at is what? First one is gospel. Second one is promises. Third one is a changed life or transformed life. Now, there are many more, so there are more sources. I'm only giving these three for today, okay? I've left out certain important ones because if I start talking about that, you'll have to stay extra one hour. Just kidding, right? I won't talk about that today. That's for future. But, but even these three sources, many people don't know that these sources are there. They don't know that when doubts come, you can go to these sources. They don't even know these are sources of assurance. Like they think gospel is only for the first time you believe in Jesus. After that, you forget about gospel, you know. They think of gospel like the door to the Christian life. You enter through the gospel. After that, you totally forget the... No. The gospel is the door and the living room and the everything. Paul is writing to the Romans, believers. First four chapters, what is he talking about? Gospel. Paul is writing to Ephesians, believers. What is he talking about? First three chapters, gospel. People don't know that the gospel is a source of assurance. People don't know. People know, but sometimes they don't realize that the promises of God, you can go to them when you have doubt, you take the promises of God and you focus on them. Today, I want you to, just knowing this will help you deal with the doubts. Right? You know now that when you have doubts, if you have doubts, you know where to go. You go to the gospel. You go to the promises of God. But one source everybody knows. You know what that is? That's the third source. Transformed life, everybody knows. I didn't even have to say it. Everybody knew it already. 
especially the people with doubts they know very well transformed life you know why because they are looking at that only and in fact that's where they are getting the doubts from <laughs> right they are looking at one john this verse i read they know very well if we keep his commandments they look at their life doesn't appear like they're keeping the commandments <laughs> the same sohors which is meant to give assurance actually ends up giving them doubt <laughs> right now why i say this is see everybody generally all the believers even without teaching it they know that one of the sources transformed life and they look at that only and get doubts many times now the what the, the trouble with that is it's not, see it is biblical that source is actually biblical the bible teaches that that is one of the tests for true salvation the person is truly saved he should keep the commandments okay that's what the bible teaches you cannot ignore that but the problem happens when you're only looking at that source when that is the only source you see when you pretend like the only matter that really matters is whether there is change or transformation in life when you forget that there are other sources when you don't know there are other sources and only this is the only criteria my friend that's a little dangerous so dangerous that will end up giving you doubts see that is why purposely i put it as number 3 it is not number 1 it is number 3 number 1 is what the gospel right it is there it is one of the sources but it's not number 1 you see i'm not trying to say our transformation is not important no it is important that's why i put it as one of the sources but it's not more important than the gospel it's not more important than the promises of god we have to put number 1 as number 1 we have to give the due credit to whoever deserves it and the gospel deserves that place number 1 the promises of god deserve that place right in fact number 3 i would put something else but i didn't want to bring it in today something about the holy spirit but i'll bring it in later See, our life our transformation our good works our obedience has to come down the list what god has done for us is more important than what we do for him it is important but it's not more important than what he has done it is one criteria but it is only one criteria listen to me it is one source it is one source why do i say this people don't know people think that's the only source you know and they end up getting doubts you see no my friend go to the gospel go to the go to this uh, promises so you know there are three sources now today right you also need to know how to how they operate you need to know not enough to know what they are you need to know how they operate practically and how you should use them practically because there is a slight complication in this these sources don't function in the same way these sources don't function in the exact same way there is a slight difference why do i say that let me explain that the first two sources the gospel of jesus christ and the promises of god the gospel and promises they are what you can call as assurance producing sources okay or assurance increasing sources now the third one changed life transformed life is not an assurance producing source or an assurance increasing source it is rather an assurance confirming source assurance confirming there is a difference why do i say let me explain that with an example right take a car or a motorcycle there is something in the car which increases the speed what is that accelerator right you press that the car goes faster that is an speed increasing source right but there is something else in the car that confirms the speed or tells you what speed you are going in what is that is the speedometer right so you look you know speedometer is what is always before your eyes right so you look there you can see it suppose the needle is you know very less showing very less car is going very slow what do you do you press the accelerator what you don't do is stretch out your hand and try to move the speedometer that's not going to increase speed that only shows you what speed you're going in it cannot increase the speed the accelerator increases the speed now you laughed for that it sounded ridiculous 
But that's exactly what people do when they don't have assurance. They look at their life. They don't see enough transformation. They don't see enough change. What do they do? They try to go and meddle with that. Either they're lamenting over the fact that there is not enough change and transformation in their life. You know, just wailing, oh my God, you know. That's like looking at the speedometer and just lamenting, oh, so slow it's going, you know. Or they're not lamenting, they're trying to work on that, focus on that. They're trying to say, okay, I'm going to, you know, with great grit and determination from now on, I'm going to make sure I don't commit that sin anymore. I'm going to make sure I improve, you know. I'm going to make sure I bring some transformation into my life. They're either lamenting the lack of transformation or they're saying, I'm going to with all my strength and power bring more transformation. But the point is they're focusing on that. But that is only a confirming source. They need to put the weight on the accelerator. The accelerator is what? The gospel of Jesus Christ. The cross. The more focus, the more focus and weight you put on that, the speed will increase. The speed of your spiritual life itself will increase. <laughs> your assurance will increase. And also the transformation also will increase. The wonder of these first two sources, gospel and promises, it's, this, it's so amazing because when you put your focus on that, what it ends up doing is it improves your life in every area. It ends up giving you more assurance and it transforms you more. If you just focus on, oh, my life is not transformed or how do I, you know, somehow try and transform more and more, the transformation also won't increase. Assurance surely will not increase. See? Another example, so that we can understand this clearly. You have a tree. You have fruit on the tree, right? The fruit on the tree is a very uh, good indicator of the tree's health. You can look at the fruit. And quickly know whether the tree is healthy or not. Now, let us say you look at the fruit and it's not very healthy. Now, what do you do? What you don't do is try to meddle with the fruit. You don't, you know, just say, you know, let me, you know, just paint this up, you know, make it look nice. No. Once you know the fruit is not good, you forget about that and you go to somewhere else. Maybe you go to the root. Maybe you pay attention to other things so that the general health of the tree can improve and the fruit also can improve. What you don't do is you fo don't focus on the fruit. But you see, when people don't have assurance, why they don't have assurance? Because they don't see enough fruit in their life. Jesus himself said, you shall know them by their fruits. He's talking about dis distinguishing between false prophets and true prophets. You shall know them by their fruits, right? Now that's extreme, but, but this principle applies. You look at your life and you don't see enough fruit or you don't see enough good quality fruit. What do you do? You don't meddle with the fruit. You don't focus too much on the fruit. You leave that as it is and you come to something else, the root from where all our solution comes from. What is the root for us? It is the cross. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is the promises of God. That is the thing that can bring true change and transformation and progress in. Life, see? The Christian approach to problem is very different from the world's approach. The world's approach is, oh, you're not good at this, you know, focus on this and improve it. The Christian approach, you're not good at this, focus on the cross and improve everything. <laughs> you know what I mean? Worldly ways are different, my friend. Another example. Let's say, you know, something is not right and you go to the doctor, right? And the doctor says, you know, take this test. And you take the test and the result comes. Now, the result will show whatever is there. That's the nature of the test result, right? It shows whatever is there. It doesn't hide anything. You see the test result, oh boy, it's not good. So what do you do now? What you don't do is you don't keep on looking at the test result. That's not going to change anything, right? What do you do? You put this aside and you go to the prescription. The doctor has given you a prescription. There's a difference between a test result and a prescription. Right? The test result simply, simply says it's not as it should be. But the prescription says you do this and it will get better. 
and the doctor writes the medicine or some you know solution to the problem that you take it and you frame it up you know not frame it up but you stick it somewhere on the fridge or somewhere where you can see it every day make sure you follow it you don't put the test result on the fridge or everybody do you do that no in fact we take the test result and go and hide it some corner and push it away right the prescription must be before our eyes it's the same thing spiritually when you look at your life that's like a test you see the result if it's good it'll say good if it's bad it'll say bad <laughs> whatever the result is even if it's bad you see it's bad fine first it, it's a very upsetting first you're sad about it okay all that is there but you put it away when you see that there is not enough transformation in your life if there is sin if there is something else not enough peace not enough joy not enough this not enough that whatever is bringing you the doubts if you can see it maybe you are upset over it you are sad over it you know you get a little depressed over it whatever it is okay after that put it away now what do you do go to the prescription the medicine which will cure it is what my friend it is the gospel of jesus christ and it is the promises of god in christianity the gospel is the cure all for everything see what jesus did in the cross of calvary in his death and resurrection is the cure for every problem that you have my friend go to that put that before your eyes see that every day and the more you see that assurance will come transformation also will and after some time if you go and take the test again you will find that the result is better but the people you know problem with people is we don't like to wait we take the test again and again i'll give you another example for that right you have a weighing machine right why do we have the weighing machine so that we can just stand on it and quickly tell as soon as you look down you know oh boy you know it's not as it should be right what do you do you get down you're a little shocked i didn't realize i was put on so much weight then what do you do have you noticed yourself doing this i've done this you know you pull in your stomach a little bit hoping this time if you do something else stand a little differently now it is showing to show significantly lesser you check your weight again it's still pretty much the same you're upset over it okay but that's not the solution what is the solution you put the weighing machine aside the solution is what something else you got to go on a diet maybe right cut down all those sugar and go to do some exercise and then come back after many days and then see the weight but you know what some people do they check the weight in the morning again they go and check the weight in the evening again next day they check the weight they get more and more upset it's not going down how is it going to go down my friend you should not be paying so much attention you should not be taking those tests so frequently the world will say introspection is a good thing too much introspection is not a good thing according to the bible according to the scriptures god's way is different my friend introspection is not the answer focusing on jesus is the answer focusing on the gospel focusing on the promises of god is the answer. don't keeping those don't keep taking those tests so often right and destroying whatever little assurance you have also okay you saw the situation is bad now go to the solution pay attention to it put more time to that give more effort to that to what to the gospel everybody say gospel and promises those are the assurance producing sources the assurance accelerating sources your life is only a assurance confirming if it's good it will say good if it's bad it will say bad it's meant to show what there is now i'll talk more in detail later on sometimes problem is when you see the life you only assess it negatively because the devil hides all the positive stuff like most people who have doubts they say you know they'll they'll assess themselves and say i have nothing positive but actually they're wrong many times sit down with them and assess them an outsider assess, that's why you should not only assess yourself you should let others also sometimes you should not just touch but that's for a different date you know different time 
we'll go into that later. Today, what have we learned? When you have doubts, go to the assurance producing sources, the gospel and the promises of God. Everybody say gospel. gospel. Promises. Gospel. When you go there, my friend, guaranteed it will drive your assurance. It will accelerate your assurance. And after some time, you will see change and transformation as well in your life. But you have to give it some time. So no matter what situation you are in, no matter how you have assessed your own life, I don't know. Don't despair. Don't think there is no hope for me. My friend, there is hope for you no matter who you are. Look to Jesus. Look to the gospel. Look to the cross. The cross will not only forgive you, it will transform you. It will deliver you from the power of that sin. Whatever it is. No matter who you are, there is hope for you. Don't let the devil just push you down with the doubts in your head. Right? Preach the gospel to him. Come, say, come on, devil, let me preach the gospel to you. He says, you are not worthy. What does he say? He says, you are not worthy. How dare you even go to God? You know, you are not worthy. What do you say? Well, I am not worthy, devil. But do you know the gospel says? All are not worthy. That's, what the, that's where the gospel begins. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody is worthy. If you see like that, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none righteous. No, not. One, Romans 3. We look at this in more detail. That's how the gospel starts. It starts by giving the bad news. Bad news is nobody can make it on their own. Good news is that's why Jesus came so that everybody who believes in it will make it because of Jesus. <laughs> Do some preaching to the devil. By the time you start, he'll run away and preach to yourself. And by the time you're through, assurance would have gone up. <laughs> Gospel, you know, devil says, you're not worthy. With what qualification can you go before God? Gospel says what? I am righteous. I, in fact, I am the righteousness of God. Right? God has justified me. That's what the gospel says. You read Romans, you know, first four chapters, we'll be looking at it maybe next week. But what does the gospel say? The gospel says God has made you righteous or God counts you as righteous. That's the better way to understand it. God counts you as how does he count you righteous? Not because you did righteousness. No, because Christ lived a perfectly righteous life. And by believe, when you believe on Jesus, a great exchange takes place. A glorious exchange. My sin goes to Jesus. And his righteousness comes to me. That's what happened on the cross. On the cross, a great exchange took place. My sin was placed on Jesus so that his righteousness will be will cover me from head to toe. When God looks at me today, you know the only reason he accepts you and me is not because of the good things we did. It's because of the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. See, we forget the gospel. That's the problem. That's why next week we'll look more detail. What I'm saying is the more you put your eyes and focus on the gospel, when the devil says you are not worthy, you don't qualify to go before God, God will never accept you in his presence. You say, I am clothed with the righteousness of Christ. Based on that, God will accept me. Right? Now what I'm talking about is something you do after repenting and after you know feeling sorry for your sin and after crying and after all that. I'm not saying don't do all that. All that is good. Repent. Feel sorry for your sin. That shows that you are, you know, really God's child. Only God's children, only true believers will feel a deep sorrow for their sin. That they've offended God. That itself shows that you're probably a true believer. Unbelievers don't feel truly sorry for their sin. They may feel sorry because of the consequences. But they don't feel sorry for the sin itself. But believers feel sorry because they have offended their God, their loving, merciful, kind, gracious God. That itself shows, you see. So feel sorry. Shed those tears if you want. You know, repent. Do whatever. But that's not the end of it, my friend. Then look to the gospel. Look to the... Just feeling for, sorry for your sin and repenting is not going to bring you out of it and give you assurance, nor bring you transformation. 
it is when you take the medicine <laughs> not enough to feel sorry oh yo i eat ate too much you know i ruined my life so far now you got to go and do the exercise right now you got to do the diet right you got to take the solution the medicine the gospel you got to go to the promises of god let me take you to a promise and <clears throat> just trying to help you to practically apply it you know let's go to john chapter 6 one place promise one promise from scripture and then we'll close today today i'm just trying to emphasize these two sources gospel and promises <clears throat> and we'll deal with this in more detail later we will deal with every source in more detail <clears throat> john chapter 6 verse 37 now let's say this is how you practically use it you look at your life right the, the quick way to assess it is the speedometer <laughs> quickly you look you know what is the situation so look at your life is it good bad if it's bad well what do you do immediately go to the promise find a promise find a promise a good promise you know later on i'll talk give you more promises but simple way to find it is google the word assurance promises <laughs> you'll find it assurance promises or assurance bible verses but here is one john 637 john 637 Jesus is speaking here and he says all that the father gives me will come to me. He means he's talking about people coming to him for salvation, okay? All that the father gives me will come to me. He's referring to people. And then look, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. The one who comes to me I will by no means. This one statement of Jesus has given me assurance so many times. the one who comes to me i will never cast out because the devil is saying now he won't accept you now you are done finished he accepted you 50 times before this now he is not going to now you are through that's it done get lost but jesus says him that cometh to me i will in no wise cast out never cast out never everybody say never that word means so much to me i hope it means something to you if you are having doubts wondering whether jesus will accept you whether god will accept you my friend jesus is looking at you and saying him that comes to me no matter who he is i will never cast out i will never reject <laughs> and it's not a, just a simple rejection that word cast out here is the same word used sometimes for casting into hell <laughs> okay and so people i think probably the emphasis more is i won't just not only is jesus saying i won't reject but he's saying i will not reject them i will not throw them in hell <laughs> i will never you know allow them to go to hell look at the next verse for i have come down from heaven not to do my own will but the will of him who sent me verse 39 this is the will of the father who sent me that of all he has given me i should lose nothing of all he has given me i should lose nothing and i will raise him up at the last day three things he is saying if you come to me i will never cast out once you come i will not lose you you see that of all whom the father has given i will not lose nothing means no one that is the real meaning i will lose no one If you come to Jesus Jesus won't reject you he'll accept you and once you've come he will not lose you and then the third thing is what I will raise him up at the last day I will raise him up at the that means what he's saying once you come to me I won't lose you I'll keep you safe until the last day when I raise you up from the dead what he's doing is he's securing our salvation from beginning to end from beginning to end he's saying nothing wrong nothing can go wrong don't worry he's guaranteeing salvation from beginning to end then he's saying if you come to me don't worry i'll never cast you out i'll never reject you and once you come i will not lose you and i'll keep you all the way to the end and i'll raise you up at that last day verse 40 three fold assurance isn't it you come to him you're safe in him you're safe till the end verse 40 and this is the will of him who 
sent me that everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Again, he's emphasizing the beginning and the end of salvation. Everyone who sees the son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the He's talking about when you first get saved and then all the way to the end. See? And I want you to look at this last thing that he says. This is the will of him who sent me. What is the will of him who sent me? This whole thing is the will not of Jesus but of the Father. He says that again, you know, previously he already said it in verse 37, all that the Father gives me. Verse 38, I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Again, third time in 40, he says, this is the will of him who sent me. What he's trying to say is this whole thing is the Father's idea. You know, some people have doubts. You know why? Because they trust in Jesus. But they're a little skeptical about this Father. They think, Jesus, you know, he died for me. He gave up everything for me. This Father, oh, I don't know what he'll do in the end, you know. Everything might be ruined because of him. They have certain people have thoughts like this because they, they have some of you, Jesus and Father, as people of different character, you know. There was a heresy in the early church based on this Marcion who said, you know, the Old Testament, God doesn't match the New Testament, God. We should cut out the Old Testament portions and throw it out, he said. There are people who have that kind of problematic thought in their head. They trust Jesus, but they don't trust the Father. You know what Jesus is saying here? You coming to him and believing in him and him not rejecting you and then him not losing you and then him keeping you safe till that last day and raising you up on the last day. Whose idea is all this? It's not Jesus' idea. It is the Father's idea. Jesus is saying, it's not even my idea, man. I didn't come up with it. The father came up with it. He planned it. He willed it. He purposed it. And I'm carrying out his plan. That should give you more assurance. Jesus is saying, don't worry. If you come, I'll never reject you. And if you come and once you're in, I'll never lose you. And I'll raise you up on the last day. And guess whose idea this was all? From the very beginning, it was the father's idea. The father loves you and cares for you. You don't have to worry about your salvation. Receive that assurance, my friend. See, the more you look at the promises of God, you get the assurance. But for this, you got to stop looking at yourself. Stop looking at your weaknesses. Stop looking at, but I have this, but this happened to me. But, the, you know, whoever, when people have doubts about salvation, you'll notice they'll always talk about me, 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 me. But I didn't do this, but I did this, but I have this. No wonder they don't have assurance. Robert Murray McChain, he said, for every time you look at yourself, look at Christ 10 times. Nothing, no problem you'll have. <laughs> Boy, if we ever did that, we'll be somewhere else. Right? For every time you look at yourself, look at Christ 10 times. Amazing man he was. My friend, don't look at yourself and lose your assurance. Look at Christ and gain your assurance. Increase in your assurance. Look at the gospel. Look at the promises of God. This is the way God has for us. And it's easy, you know. In some ways, it is easy. I trust that you will put this into practice in your life. And if you don't have doubts today, it may come in handy tomorrow. If it doesn't come handy for you, it will come handy for someone else. People, you can advise other people. You can help other people struggling with these kinds of doubts. Not only that, these are the same things you do when you have doubts of any kind. Let me say that and close. Any kind, whatever your doubt is, don't take the doubt lightly. That doubt is the thing which stops us from progressing in life, you see. See, some people today are facing very terrible circumstances and they're, they're, they're hearing voices in their head that go something like this, you know. If God is with you, how did all this happen? If God's word is true, then why did all this happen? If God loves you, then what about all this, you know? Oh, so voice after voice after voice, you hear it and hear it. Don't just keep quiet, my friend. No, go to the gospel and look at Jesus on the cross and assure yourself, no, God is for me. If God be for me, who can be 
against me if he delivered up his own son for us all will he not also freely with him give us all things look at the gospel go to the promises of god and say no no matter what this voice says i will believe that god is with me and god said he will never leave me nor forsake me therefore i will say the lord is my helper i will not fear what can man do unto you see you got to talk when the thoughts run in your head this has to open up your mouth has to one word from your mouth is more powerful than many thoughts in your head you open your mouth you speak the word of god these thoughts will go sometimes they won't go immediately but they will go god has given our mouth we, we know this you know this you've heard this teaching right the words of your mouth have power and when you put god's word in your mouth and you open it and say god's word what happens these doubts go away my friend don't take those doubts lightly deal with the doubt wage warfare with the doubts in your mind no matter what doubts those are how do you wage warfare go to the gospel and go to the promises of god once those doubts go faith rises and the next thing is victory then this is the order my friend this is the way god blesses us prospers us this is the way he wants us to progress in life this is god's way his ways are higher than our ways we are thinking the biggest problem is my problem but god says the biggest problem is not the problem outside it's the problem inside our mind the mind is the battlefield thoughts and arguments and all kinds of things going there open your mouth and speak the word of god and bring it into control stand in faith with patience until you see the victory let's all stand up let's all pray and ask god to lead us in this direction to put more focus on him on his gospel the solution to all our problems the cross is death is resurrection how that helps us practically today and the promises of god may god give us a greater desire to run to his promises to cherish them to meditate upon them to see every word of his promise and take it seriously oh we thank you lord we praise you thank you for teaching us and giving us clarity we pray you will continue to speak to us and impress these truths in our heart we pray lord that uh, people with doubts about their salvation will apply these truths and that they will get great assurance true assurance from the gospel of jesus christ from the promises of god we pray even for people who are going through other kinds of problems lord help them to focus on these things help them realize that your gospel is all powerful and it saves from any kind of problem lord help them to realize that your promises cover every area in their life and contains the answer for whatever they need thank you lord lead us to put more focus and attention on you oh lord and as before we leave this place i pray that you will help us each person to put away doubts and worry and fear at least to a certain degree in the name of jesus help them to cast their burdens onto you whatever it be in the name of jesus right now let the people cast their burdens onto you lord and when they go out of here let them go with the peace of god that passes all understanding let them go with the confidence that you are with them and you are for them and you will help them and that you love them We bless them in your mighty name, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us for now and forevermore. Amen.